Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Nana Gulic, uh, and I am here today uh, to start us all off. Uh, today is yet another ICIE talk session. The title is Empowering Learners for a Creative Tomorrow. And our special guest today is Professor Dr. Christine Boyko Head from Mohawk University from Canada. Uh, Christine Boyko Head is an in interdisciplinary scholar, creative education consultant, thinking preferences and design thinking facilitator, curriculum specialist, author, and playwright. She has thought, presented, and published nationally and internationally. Between 2001 and 2011, she confirmed her belief in the empowerment of learners through the arts by teaching for Lesley University's integrated teaching through the Arts Master of Education program. Currently, she applies creative problem solving and art-based strategies in the college classroom to create anti-oppressive spaces enhancing learners' creative critical thinking. Her eclectic experiences include television production, creating and operating a social issues theater company, co-founding an arts magazine for and by young people, creating a community mentoring four-year curriculum for youth, designing and implementing a million dollar fundraising community campaign, being an Ontario College Program Quality Auditor, and researching applied theater strategies to increase learners' self-efficacy and literacy. Alert to new learning opportunities, she is currently involved in a, an intercultural collaboration between Canadian post-secondary students and elementary students in Croatia. She's also designing a creativity curriculum for recovering substance abusers in her community. Her energized interactive workshops have given her the opportunity to meet dedicated educators and lifelong learners around the world, including 21 states in the USA, Israel, Turkey, Jordan, Portugal, France, and now Finland. She lives in Southern Ontario, Canada, and teaches at Mohawk College. With us today is also Professor Tessir Yamin, a General Director at International Center for Innovation and Education, and he will give a brief introduction to today's topic. Uh, thank you, Nana, for this introduction. Uh, and first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Dr. Christine Boykohead in this ICIE talk and keynote uh, speech. She is going to talk about communication, collaboration, and the critical thinking as they are identified in various reports as essential 21st century employability thinking frameworks and the associated uh, thinking skills. Yet many educators teach communication through a read, write, repeat model and ask students to repeat without analyzing or comprehending others' ideas through rigidly structured essays and reports. Many learners in the post secondary communications classrooms struggle with expression, distrust, collaboration, and doubt their critical thinking. Clearly, the read, write, repeat model of communication education is not working for everyone. This interactive and interesting presentation shares Christine's Mind the Gap project and how creative strategies might contribute to the development of effective, productive, learn center differentiated learning experiences. In specific, she details the role problem solving and cognitive preference awareness it plays in giving learners a value neutral language for critical reflection and how this awareness can lead to the self-regulated learning behavior and self-differentiated learning strategies, creating engaged and in, uh, inclusive, uh, uh, and, uh, inclusive and empathetic. So welcome uh, to the ICIE talks. And I would like to give uh, just a few minutes as an introduction by Christine Boyko Head, and then we will proceed to the uh, recorded part. Okay, thank you so much, Tazir and, and Nana. I am really excited to be here, a little nervous in watching the recording of this keynote, um, but I hope you all enjoy it. 
And I would just like to um, thank all of you for, for coming, number one. And also, I would like to say that my colleague, uh, Glennis McQueen Fuentes, is actually on this call. And you will see her in a video you're going to see in our presentation. And we did the Mind the Gap project uh, together at Mohawk College. And I also want to give a little um, shout to one of my students that happens to be on this call. Now, she's not discussed in the presentation you're going to hear, but she definitely um, is, is, I think, someone who helped me with my thinking through this whole process and showing me how this can work with, with students. And I certainly want to thank her for coming on this, this call and uh, also congratulate her because she's been accepted to one of our nursing programs in, in Canada. So for all of the rest of you around the world, I would love to hear your thoughts and comments about what you're going to be watching. If you were here yesterday and watched the, the keynote recording of yesterday's talk about creativity, this is, a, a, I think, an ideal follow-up to what was said yesterday by, by Dr. Arthur Goltz that, about creativity in general, our need for it. And he was talking in very broad terms about how these are important skills that, that we all need to have. And I think this talk that you're going to hear follows nicely upon that talk because now you can see some practical uses in the classroom of how to create those skills and help students gain those, those key skills such as creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. So thank you, Tazir, for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Tazir, for that, that introduction. And I am really pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you about my passion for teaching and learning. And um, I, I'm so glad that you all are here with me to go on this journey. So for today, for the next little while, this is the agenda that we're gonna be looking at. We're gonna talk about the educational and industrial context here in Canada, where I am from. And I'm gonna talk about the challenge that I faced as a post-secondary instructor, the impact of, of that challenge, and we're going to watch a video about a research project that a lot of what this presentation is focusing on is going to be referring to. And uh, then I do have an extra bonus for you that when you are looking at this recording, you can go to this bit.ly uh, link and it'll take you to a mural whiteboard. And on that whiteboard, you can actually see testimonials from learners. That, that I've had over the years. So this is our agenda. But to start us off, what I'd like to do is open with an activity. So if you could get a piece of paper, maybe a pen or pencil, and I want you to look at this door on the screen. And doors are really wonderful things. They're possibilities and opportunities. They open to a world of wonder and surprise, but they can also close quickly if we aren't ready to step in and see the promise that they hold beyond their hinges. I invite you to draw, write, or symbolize the ideal learning environment on the other side of this door. So I'm going to give you, until the music ends, to envision your ideal learning classroom and environment.
So you have about 20 seconds more. So just finish your final drawings or thoughts. Okay, thank you for that. And we're going to come back to that later in this presentation. So what I'm going to talk to you about now is the current educational context. And this is what it looks like. Our classes are diverse in so many ways. Yet what do we know about these learners? Only really what we see. And that isn't the whole story. What you can think about doing is list what don't we know about this group. We don't know their emotional needs. We don't know their abilities, their learning styles. We don't know their goals. We don't know their intents or what motivates them. We don't know the specifics regarding how they learn best, what motivates them to engage with the curriculum and how to make that curriculum relevant to them as learners. We have so many learners in our classrooms, especially in the post-secondary. Uh, classes, and they have specific preferences and needs. And for that reason, differentiation is vital. Yet, how do we do that? What we see in our classrooms right now are more females, more Indigenous students, more international students, more mature students, more second career students, or people that are coming back to start afresh, more first generation students and students with diverse abilities. Their social emotional needs differ as do their economic needs. This is the classroom of now and it's a positive thing. It also reflects the industrial diversity that is going on worldwide. And over the years, many scholars and reports have been advocating for transferable employability skills as a way to ensure that learners are robot-proofed for the future. This means that we need to identify the skill gap that exists between what learners have or what graduates have and what industry needs. Industry has been telling us in such reports as McKinsey reports, IBM, even the World Economic Forum and OECD report more dexterous competencies are needed. And these include critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. Becoming proficient in these transferable skills is what many experts say are the tools learners need to brace them for change and prepare them for a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous future. And boy, are we in that future now. So in both education and industry, we see a minimizing of the familiar and a maximizing of the diverse regarding demographics and needs. There is great learning potential in this sort of scenario as we push ourselves to see things differently, unlearn what was taken for granted and learn new ways of thinking. But that was always a choice before COVID. Now, in the COVID learning environment, we are forced, all of us, to think, learn, work, and live differently, flexibly, and creatively. 
But according to York's and Castle, diversity has a paradox that it has the high potential for creativity and innovation. And we've seen that when COVID closed face-to-face -face classrooms and forced everyone online. We saw how educators everywhere and learners stepped up to become more creative and innovative. Mind you, it was stressful. I don't want to undermine that. But the creativity and innovation that we've seen over the last 18 months has been incredible. All of this is because we come to the landscape of diversity with different values, beliefs, experiences, and, and ideas. However, those same values can re result in a high potential for resistance and conflict. The more diverse the learners, the less likely it is, according to York's and Castle, that they will be able to create an empathic field that enables them to understand the other's point of view, thus blocking their capacity to lead each other toward growth and transformation. This paradox exists in our classrooms between seeing the high potential for creativity and the high potential for resistance and conflict. And what I've been witnessing prior to COVID in my face-to-face -face classrooms has been a disproportionate presence of the resistance and conflict due to diversity. We see the negative side of the paradox of diversity in a variety of ways. And the one that I have really seen frequently in my learners is this idea of resisting collaboration. And collaboration is a key transferable skill for a successful work life. So what I see is some students, when they hear about collaboration, they'll grin and bear it. Others will give you the verbal rumblings. You know, they tell you about the people they don't want to work with. Then you get some people that will take it to the official level of complaining about their teammates. And all of this can lead to what I'm going to call conscious bias, not unconscious. It is very deliberate that because of the conflict and resistance they experienced in their collaborations with others, they've consciously taken it to a personal level and created stereotypes and single stories about the people they're having issues with. This is happening in our classrooms. It's also happening in the workforce because 86% of employers say that a lack of collaboration and ineffective communication is the cause of workplace failures. So really, we aren't preparing our students properly with the transferable skills that will make them successful in the workforce. And so the conflict we're seeing in our classrooms over certain issues, we're also seeing in the workplace. So let me introduce you to my teaching context and the challenge that actually started me along this research path. It started in 2013. And it was when I was teaching a mandatory communication course for pre-health learners. These learners will go on to the uh, university and they will be RNs, nurses, some of them may be doctors, they'll be therapists. They're in the healthcare field. That's what they care about. And my challenge was that they were, they didn't have good communication skills. They lacked a sense of what the relevance was between what I was teaching them in communications and what their future was going to hold for them in healthcare. So this gave them a low motivation in my class. And they also had very little autonomy because we had structured exams and, and essays. So I'm going to introduce you to Rihanna. And she was one of my best students ever. She went on to be a registered nurse. She was a lovely individual, very caring and compassionate. She would make a wonderful nurse. Yet, 
At the end of this course, when she had to write a reflection on her experience with her co-learners uh, uh, and her collaborative team, she wrote a very oppositional paper. It was all about us and them. And the them were those people that she felt did not work fairly or equally in the team project. While her reflection was still very polite, it was very clear that everything was the other person's fault. There should be repercussions for what those people did. And being that she was my 98% student, I never saw this in her other than in her writing. It actually symbolized what other people were more verbal and vocal about. Um, and, and it was a problem that the collaboration that students had to do in their classrooms was becoming personalized. And people were actually having a bad experience that they were carrying into their reflections and their life after. So that's where I thought things had to change. I had to do something about the curriculum. I had to differentiate it enough. I had to make it engaging and relevant enough by tapping into what my students needed. And that would take some time because I had very large classes and very diverse classes in terms of discipline as well. Because remember, I'm teaching a mandatory communications course. So I'm gonna ask you now, before I go any further, to go back to your door and that ideal classroom. When you made your design, to what degree did you consider any of the following elements? And what we're gonna do, because maybe some of you have been sitting in front of a computer for a while, we're going to raise our hands up if it was a high degree of consideration. We'll do the come see, come saw. If it was a medium uh, thought process that went into some of these considerations and then just shake our arms down uh, at our sides. If it wasn't something we considered at all in that very brief span of time when I had you think about your ideal classroom. So to what degree did you consider being culturally responsive to your classes? To what degree were you human-centered in that learners were your focus? To what degree did you think of accessibility in this ideal classroom? And what about inclusion and equity? How about diversity in all its forms? And what about democratic practices? Did you figure that into the ideal classroom? Or how about building community and a sense of belonging? Was that a major consideration? Was it somewhat considered? Or did you totally forget about it? And then the big one, differentiation. How did that play into your ideal environment? We want learners to have an awareness an appreciation and an embodiment of all of these issues. But before we can empower learners, we need to be empowered ourselves and have the tools to design curriculum that minimizes the familiar and maximizes the diverse in a way that stimulates growth rather than conflict. So how might we move beyond using only the physical and visible an incomplete evidence that we demonstrated in the opening activity and get to mining the things we didn't know about them yet are significant to learner success. This question is what my research explored and actually I'm living research all the time is exploring in every classroom I teach and I invite you to consider all of these things as I go forward in this presentation. So when designing that ideal classroom, did you have learners in mind? This is that human-centered approach to things, or in Canada, we call it the outcomes-based education, 
where it's what the learner demonstrates at the end, which guides our curriculum. So if you were thinking about your learners, what were they like? Were they like Dan? And this is actually a student that I had a few years ago. And just look at his stance. He gave me permission to share this photograph with you. And again, we're gonna do a physical activity just to get things moving a bit. So uh, what I'd like you to do is when I call out some of the adjectives that Dan might be, if you think he has this characteristic just by looking at him, then give a big clap, okay? So if you think Dan is strong, let's clap for him. If you think he's secure, let's give another clap. Do you think he's a risk taker? Is he focused? Is he self-assured? Is he secure and confident in himself? Do you think he's engaged and driven and motivated towards goals? Well, let me tell you, Dan certainly does deserve our clapping. He is a graduate from three years ago, and these adjectives describe him exactly. This is where he is now, and I still stay in contact with him, so I know this. He's catapulted himself in the company that he works for. He's doing extremely well, and on top of that, he's happy and content. But that's not where he was when I first met him. That's not where he was in high school or elementary school. He wasn't at this point until the last semester of his three years at my college in Canada. Many most secondary, post-secondary learners struggle with organizing and expressing their thoughts. They feel unheard, anxious, stressed. They resist collaboration because beyond kindergarten, they were not taught how to work with others and especially others who may be different than themselves. They're unable to risk creatively and think critically because they lack confidence, self-esteem and self-efficacy. They are shy, uncertain, and insecure. And they assume that learning cannot be fun, empowering, engaging, or energizing. And as my colleague, Nana Gulick from Croatia, mentioned in a presentation she gave to Canadian audiences a few months ago, the pandemic has only increased these feelings and concerns. And they've act it's actually added fear to this list. What you're looking at now is another student profile. This is Daniela, and the words in her thought bubble were words that I had collected from students in a survey about how they were feeling in their semester. The drawing was done by Daniela in a final course reflection, and the quotation on the left is what she started that final reflection with. I have very low self-esteem. I couldn't think about my redeeming qualities that I possess that would be considered super. I was grasping at straws trying to figure out what I had. I claimed defeat and lost the mark. What Daniela is telling me at the end of a course is how she felt at the beginning of that course, when the assignment was to introduce yourself to the class and come up with a superhero that embodied what you felt you had at that moment in time. When Danielle wrote this, it was at the end of the course. And this was during COVID. So all I saw was her name in the little one inch square on Zoom. I didn't know any of this. All I did know was that she took a zero for an assignment. 
And what were my assumptions about that? Did I think that she had low self-esteem and that I could somehow help her? Or did I just think she was uninterested, unengaged, and it was her choice to take this zero? We certainly could not predict the last 18 months and how it would force all of us to think, learn, work, and live differently, flexibly, and creatively as familiar notions of teaching and learning are challenged by the unfamiliar territory we're all in. The dramatic shift in the world of work and education has amplified the diversity of our learners and amplified their unique needs. It's also intensified the need for the transferable skills, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. If we didn't know how learners were before, now think about how difficult it is to get to know them when they're only a one inch nameplate on a screen. The face-to-face -face contact is no longer there, but we can't make that an excuse for not taking the time to find out who our learners are. And it does take time and it takes will as well. So I invite you to imagine if learners felt empowered rather than disempowered. If the thought bubble I showed you before changes to this thought bubble, where learners are confident and strong in their self-expression, they have a sense of competency, effectiveness, and achievement in their critical thinking, and they feel self-assured and clear in their written and verbal communication. Now imagine that they felt this way because they discovered a framework that helped them get the words in their brain onto paper in a way that anyone could understand. Imagine if they internalized a framework and they could apply it instinctively to any situation or subject matter in every context they encountered, and they knew they could grow with this framework throughout their personal and professional lifetime. Imagine that. All of these factors, the changing face of our classrooms, the changing needs of learners, individualized strengths and insecurities, and the resistance, as well as the high potential to join in the unfamiliar, all of these things inspired me and my colleague, Glennis McQueen Fuentes, who was a uh, theater professor at Brock University, she's now retired, it inspired us to take a leap and do the Mind the Gap project. Mind the Gap had these three research questions as its focus, but it became so much more as the impact of what we were doing trickled into our other courses and our other encounters with learners. So what I'm going to invite you to do now is watch a video. It's about four minutes long that students made about the Mind the Gap project. Many educators teach communication through a read, write, repeat model and ask students to regurgitate somebody else's ideas through rigidly structured essays and reports. The current labor market demands more than regurgitation. Communication is a pliable skill requiring flexibility, agility, originality, and individuality, and defines the individual's position in, toward, and with the world. The Mind the Gap project approaches a typical communications course from the perspective of applied theater and art-based practices to teach creative critical thinking and communication skills at the post-secondary level. Taking a design thinking approach to curriculum, this experimental course explores issues defined by students and encourages them to deal critically and creatively with their reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of the world. Humans are natural storytellers and we all have narratives reflecting our cognitive systems, but not everyone uses the same system. 
As a result, Hammond tells us, the cognitively rich will only get academically richer, while the cognitively poor will get academically poorer, as small differences in learning abilities, such as information process, are allowed to grow into large gaps. When we ignore gaps, they widen, deepen, and become a threat to individual and community well-being. The Mind the Gap project asks, how might we transform achievement gaps within and between learners to create positive spaces, leading to increased intellectual, social, and emotional capacity? In Mind the Gap's applied theater and arts-based environment, we transformed the classroom from a lecture hall to a more collective, responsive experience. We shared stories, concerns, questions, and experiences to gain a better understanding, appreciation, and acceptance of diverse cognitive, experiential, and communication systems. Seeing gaps as positive spaces, we explored an interactive, democratic framework for teaching 21st century skills, such as communication and collaboration. We celebrated minimizing the familiar and maximizing the diverse as we explored how others think, problem solve, and communicate in ways that might be different from the norm. Rather than these differences being a point of conflict, we learned how to use language to accurately, objectively, and constructively describe diverse experiences, approaches, perspectives as valid social narratives. In this way, we created an equitable, empathetic learning community that enabled learners to mine their communication capacity and practice authentic expression with confidence and clarity. Going into the communications class, I would describe it as like a little overwhelming at first. But Christine and Glennis eased us in and from there we basically just had a lot of fun. It was always different, so you never really knew what to expect walking into the class. The professors were very like hands-on. Um, they made us like get up and do a bunch of uh, icebreaker activities. A lot of exercises that really enhance communication skills and like critical thinking. Christine and Glennis are my favorite teachers ever. They're so sweet and kind and they really worked with our schedules as well and wanted to accommodate everybody, which I appreciated so much. My biggest takeaway from this class was that learning doesn't have to be necessarily sitting down and just having someone talk at you. We got different groups every week and with that we became really close. It felt like a family almost. Mind the Gap invited learners to co-develop the curriculum and to teach critical creative thinking and communication skills in a more design-centered, inclusive way. It celebrated a diverse post-secondary population by enhancing emotional competencies and giving voice to those who remain in the gaps. It retrieved our storytelling capacity by practicing authentic expression with confidence, creativity, and clarity. It was inclusive by redefining not just the campus, but the roles we play on campus and who is responsible for meaning-making and knowledge sharing. Created a dream catcher. We hope that your dreams come true. We hope you remember all you the hope. passion <laughs> and that you're capable of anything you set your minds to. So you just watched the video that was actually made by students at Mohawk as well. This project was um, involving students in many different ways. And what I do want to say is that what we were doing here was very arts-based and creativity-based. That was our, our main agenda, was to explore the use of unfamiliar post-secondary tools in the teaching of communication, collaboration, and critical thinking in this mandatory course. So you do have to think about your audience. I don't use some of those art-based tools in other classes I'm teaching. When I'm teaching electrical technicians, I know that's not going to work for them. So keep that, that in mind, that you need to think about your audience. But I also encourage you to look out for the booklet, Mind the Gap, that ICIE is going to be publishing because it actually contains all the activities and exercises that we did with this group of, of students.
So what we were doing was we were pivoting away from the familiar modes of how we teach communication, critical thinking, and collaboration in the Mind the Gap project. And the, the video that, that you saw certainly minimized the familiar and maximized the, the diverse in really everything that, that we did. So as I already said, it may not be appropriate for all your classes to do some of the things that we did. And I know I certainly am constantly checking for the appropriateness of certain activities in certain classes with certain audiences. But I do want to share with you two very key frameworks that got developed really in the Mind the Gap project and now are transforming other learners in other classes. So the actions that I want to share with you that were so transformative involved the foresight thinking preferences, the three debriefing model, and then the use of creativity tools and strategies based on the thinking preferences and the three debriefing model. So to start first with three debriefing, and I did a longer uh, workshop on this uh, about a month ago with ICIE, and I'm just going to give an overview here just to tease you with interest. The three debriefing model involves three very simple questions. What, so what, now what? And it's a reflective tool. It stems from paramedic training, where you think about it, healthcare workers need to know very quickly what has happened. So what is the significance of these injuries? And now what do we do to help the patient get better? What I would like you to do to try this model is to go back to that ideal environment with the door activity. And what I'd like you to very quickly do as I'm speaking through the model is I want you to jot down what did you do first, second, third, fourth, fifth, when you did that activity. So I'm using the model here for you to look at the process that you went through, not the product. So what did you do first? What did you do second, third? Did you start writing right away? Did you maybe draw? Did you sit and think? That's what I want you to itemize. Then we move to the so what. So what is the significance of this? And the so what is analytical and it's interpretive. The final question, now what, pushes us into the future with now what can I carry forward based on what I did? Or now what did I learn that I want to take forward? Or what do I want to stop doing? So this is the reflective process. What, so what, now what? This aligns with Bloom's taxonomy. It shows scaffolded learning from simple identification to more complex evaluation and creativity at the end. But I call it 3D briefing because it has a three-dimensional quality to it. It is not just reflective. My students showed me that it is also predictive or anticipatory. So now I use it with students, especially when they're going into collaborative projects, to anticipate or predict what might happen. So what will be the significance of that? And now what can they do to either minimize or maximize what they've predicted? It also is a process that can create the product itself any form of communication follows this model. And as I said, I could talk about this in a whole other session, but all you're going to get is this little taste because I want to share with you what students have said about it. So here are some examples of what learners have written about the 3D briefing model. The first student, it makes me feel more capable as a writer. Another student said, I use it in all my courses to improve my critical thinking. How great is that? 
that something we teach in one course transfers to the others. That's ideal. Another student wrote, it helped me get the words from my brain onto paper, which I had already quoted earlier in this presentation. Another student, without having to worry about the organization of my ideas, I'm able to focus on speaking confidently and being engaging. And then this other quote quotation that I have here, it allows me to confidently resolve important issues because I now feel confident in presenting my point of view and feeling prepared to tackle problems, including world peace. This idea of world peace, you might think, is an exaggeration. However, these students were working on an essay, a research essay, that had them looking at the UN sustainability goals in order to create a better world. So the idea here of world peace was not just something they threw in here. It really was what they were working on throughout the semester. These are just five quotations from students. I have actually more than 450 testimonials from, from students about the 3D briefing model. And I, without an exaggeration, can say no one has ever had a negative response to that model. And here is one that I really want to share with you uh, because it was not solicited. This was a student who was working on something called the Treasure Writing Project. And really when it comes to writing, the fear of the blank page is real for many, many learners. The 3D briefing model helps learners who struggle with written and verbal communication due to a lack of confidence, a lack of self-esteem, a lack of structure, a lack of knowing how and where to start and proceed on an assignment. It shows them that writing is not an innate ability and that they don't have it, but that it's a problem to solve through process thinking. So this assignment was called the Treasure Writing Project, and it was designed in response to COVID when we were all forced to go online. My students had to make five automatic writing journal entries accompanied by a photograph. And automatic writing, if you don't know, is where you just write the thoughts in your head. There's no thought to structure. You don't worry about grammar. You don't worry about paragraphing or spelling. You just get what is in your mind onto the paper. What is so interesting about this young woman's entry is that she puts the what, so what, now what model at the top of the page for her rough copy. And she writes it as a rough copy, but there really wasn't a good copy. They were to submit just what they wrote. So we can see here, she's using this model to get at her, her to help organize her thoughts, but to get them onto the page. And so she puts for the first one, what? Getting myself help. So what? Getting some help, starting to feel a little better. She's interpreting that she's feeling a little better. And then now what? Are her future actions, a lot better still, need help to get by. And she writes about her struggles. The Treasure Project's objective, because we have course learning outcomes, was basically to enhance communication. It was to help students improve their written skills. But also, because of COVID, I wanted to use this form as a possible coping strategy for students that I was no longer seeing in person and that may have been struggling to figure out what the world was like at this time. And again, I have many more examples of this activity, but what I wanted to highlight here was how she used the 3D briefing model on her own as a structure. So that's my little teaser for 3D briefing. I'm now going to go into the thinking preferences awareness that I stressed in Mind the Gap, but that I stress with all my students because of its impact on collaboration as well as self-awareness. Many of you may be familiar with this model because it is based on the Parnes and Osborne creative problem-solving model that is over 60 years old. 
And basically it asks you to clarify the challenge you're working on, generate ideas, develop solutions, and then do those solutions. And then of course it starts all over again. And we reflect on, on how well we, we did. What thinking preferences identifies is our biases and our increased energy levels towards certain steps in this process. So with certain learners, if they're part of an official research project like the Mind the Gap group, and I've also done this with other specific discipline-based learners, then they do an online assessment, which gives them a profile and various other resources. But I've also designed a, another way to do this with students that are not in an official research capacity, because I think this information is very important for them to have. And I just actually did this with a group of grade seven and eight students where I created a bingo game uh, for, for their teachers to implement with, with them. So it can be done with any age group. And here's what we're looking at. So once learners are aware of the thinking preferences through a workshop that is very interactive, we reflect on the process, not the product, but the process that, that they created in the workshop to introduce thinking preferences. So we're gonna practice this again with your ideal environment. So going back to that door activity, I want you to think about, um, you've already done the three debriefing of the process, but now we're gonna add that level of energy to what you identified. So what problem solving steps gave you the most engaged energy in that short amount of time? And so what is the significance of that? And now what other problem solving steps might have helped you create that ideal environment? So if we go through the thinking preference or the problem solving steps, do you get energy from researching a topic? Would you like, would you have liked more time to research that ideal environment? Look at other examples out there, go to the internet, or maybe you had questions uh, about that assignment. Then that is the researcher side of, of the problem solving model. Maybe some of you just jumped into ideas. You had all sorts of things and your page was full of diagrams and points because you just in your mind had various things connecting about what this ideal environment would look like. Or maybe some of you started to get energized by the details. What would this actually look like in minute detail? Let's really put the flesh on this skeleton. Or maybe some of you are just ready to jump into action and start that school or that classroom. So researching, ideating, developing, and implementing are part of the problem-solving model. That's the process. But each person has a bias towards one or more of those steps. And do we realize it? Do learners realize it? This is where I was finding the resistance and the conflict from diversity was coming from, that learners were actually misidentifying this difference in how they think as a difference relating to ethnicity, age, gender, and that becomes a very uh, um, difficult and serious thing. So we need to stop that and thinking preferences enabled me to show students that it's about how we think, not who we are. And let me give you in a little bit more detail why that is. When we identify our preference, we use adjectives describing our actions and behaviors and what we like to do. And so we're now able to apply that to the individuals we work with. So I'll tell you that I'm a high ideator and a high implementer, known as a driver. So I come up with ideas and I do them. Then I think about whether they're going to work or not. If I were working with someone who was a high clarifier or a high developer, we might be at odds because I'm working faster than that person would like. 
and they're working slower than I would like. Now, if I understand it's because they're a developer preference, then that's okay. But if I start to attribute that to laziness, to being um, not caring, to not committed, and I then also associate that with who they are as an individual, what ethnicity they have, what their age is, what their gender is, we have a serious problem. And is that maybe where some of the world's problems are coming from when it comes to stereotyping people? So what I have found is that thinking preference language allows students to be more accurate about what is happening in their collaborations, even if there isn't a problem. But if there is a problem, it gives them a better language to use. The person is more focused as opposed to lazy. The person is more flexible and imaginative as opposed to scatterbrained. And isn't that a positive thing to have a language like this that we can use? So the tools and strategies of thinking preferences works on two levels. There's the group level. So as an instructor, I get a cohort profile if they do the online assessment. If they don't, I can still figure this out by using my, my own makeshift assessment. But this is a class profile. This is a group of business analysts, actually. So I can see that they're high clarifiers and developers, and I don't have that many people that are comfortable with ideating or implementing. So this can inform how I design my curriculum. And there is a correspondence from year to year. I've done this with three different business analyst groups. Their profiles are the same. I've done electrical technicians for the last three years. Their class profile is the same because there's a vocation fit going on here. But it helps me design a curriculum that is suitable for them starting with their strengths and then expanding them into, into the unfamiliar zone. It also works on the individual level because the individuals can get a graph that tells them where they are. And there's no bad scores. This isn't like um, a, a test where you have a right or wrong answer. This is just giving you more insight into who you are and why you think the way you think. And so this can help me as an instructor provide very targeted counseling for students. That that student, Daniela, remember her who didn't hand her assignment? I may have assumed she was lazy or had time management problems. But if I did this profile on her, I might see that she's very capable, but what she needs is an actual strategy and I can now target that strategy for, for her. So it, in fact, back to my context of that pre-health class, it helped me redesign my curriculum so that I could improve engagement and motivation with those pre-health students I had because I saw that their profiles, their biases, we're leaning towards clarifying and developing. And my bias as an ideator implementer meant that my open-ended questions were going to cause them stress. So I had to ease them into that as opposed to start them there. <clears throat> so once again, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> once again, I want to show you what some of my students have said about thinking preferences in particular. So I can improve on my interactions with other types of problem solvers in the future. Thinking profiles can be used in and outside the classroom. I got into a loop of clarifying, ideating, developing, then doing more research, ideating, developing. I almost missed the due date and had to rush to the finish. This particular student identified how they handled a research paper assignment. And I asked all the students to do that, to think about, in relation to thinking preferences, what was your process? 
And they could see that this rushing to finish that they were always doing with every assignment was something they could change because they could get out of the loop that they were in. The last two quotations are actually, I think, really significant. They came from international students and they, the one said, we're not only a team, now we are a family because of how they use thinking preferences to overcome their differences. And what I was seeing more and more was in collaborative teams that involve Canadian domestic students and international students, there would be conflict because of the differences in beliefs and values and experiences. And thinking preferences enable people to see that their thinking differently was what was going on in these, these groups. And they were able to communicate better. The last one, not only did we work together, but we became friends. And that's something to carry with me for the rest of my life. So according to MJ Allen, learning is viewed as a cognitive and social progress process in which students construct meaning through reflection and through their interaction with faculty, fellow students, and others. Discovering who our students are as learners, as thinkers, as problem solvers, can help us minimize diversity's high potential for conflict and resistance and maximize the high potential for creativity, innovation, and equity. We know from research from the OECD and other uh, scholars that engagement and motivation is important, as is collaboration and self-awareness. But to get engagement and motivation, students need to feel a sense of autonomy. They need to feel that the content is relevant and they need to feel mastery over the, over the, over the skills that they're learning. And for collaboration and self-awareness, they need a language that they can share. 3D briefing provides students with a structure <clears throat> for their thinking and their creating of communication materials. Thinking preference awareness gives them an awareness to themselves and others and a language in which to connect and communicate over. So together, these frameworks give learners greater autonomy, better motivation and engagement, improved confidence in their transferable skills. And how do I know this? Because I have hundreds of samples from students that are reflecting on these two things. And many of those are not, they were not solicited. They were just reflect on what you will carry forward from this particular course. So if you wanna see those, we can do that another time. Um, the essential goal of empowered learning and differentiation, according to Tomlinson and Moon, is to develop awareness of which approaches to learning work best for students under which circumstances and to guide them to know when to change approaches for better learning outcomes. Thinking preferences and 3D briefing help the students self-differentiate. I can't differentiate the hundreds of students I see every semester, but I can certainly give them tools and guidance to know which of those tools are best for them. And more importantly, especially now with education in the world the way it is, discovering who our students are as learners and as people is key to differentiated instruction. Overall, what I've shared with you today has had this impact. It's increased self-awareness and self-differentiation in my learners, no matter what discipline they've come from. It's enhanced empathetic communication and created greater equitable collaborations. It's generated more flexible thinking in my students as they minimize the familiar and maximize the diverse. And it's increased their respect for diversity on all different levels. And it's created a creative, inclusive, inclusive, empathetic learning space for all. My ideal classroom 
It encourages empathetic communication, equitable collaboration, and creative, critical thinking. It empowers learners to step responsibly into the world in order to transform the world. My class minimizes the familiar and maximizes the diverse through arts-based strategies. That may not work for all of you, but there may be parts of this presentation that you can take and adapt to your ideal learning environments. And of course, it's all about adaptation. You make things work to your own environment. Don't take what I've presented here as the only way to do it. Take something, leave the rest. But what I want you to consider is that education, according to Tomlin Tomlinson again, is the, link, is the linking of students with meaningful learning, enabling collaboration that extends human understanding and preparing students for a world that will demand of them both reason and wisdom. We always needed these things, but now we need them even more. And so remember Daniela, remember the student that gave up on that assignment because she didn't feel anything was super about her. And remember the thought bubble that all those other students had, the words that they used? Well, this was also in that reflection that she gave at the end of the course. Not only did she tell me what happened at the beginning, but here's where she ended up. I'm still improving, but I learned skills that are applicable to my future. My superhero's power is courage. I realized lacking these fundamental skills was hindering my progress, and I wouldn't get anywhere if I stayed in the same place without challenging myself. One day, I will have a TED Talk of my own. And I know, Daniela, I'll be watching, and I hope you will be too. Thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate any comments, suggestions, questions. I look forward to having a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, my dear friend, Dr. Christine boyko for this impressive keynote. It is really very interesting and formative lecture. Uh, we are so proud of you and highly appreciate your continuous contribution. So we are looking forward to seeing you also in our conference in Finland. Yes, as, I hope so. <laughs> as a keynote, and uh, we highly appreciate also uh, the contribution of your institution at the international level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.